Hey family, happy new year. Happy new year. From our family to yours. Uh, we believe, as C.S. Lewis said, there are far, far better things ahead than anything we leave behind. As we navigate through this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we believe together we can get through it together as we pray. Um, this is not my typical COVID office, but I do pray that God would allow good weather so I could shoot across the ocean. Uh, beauty, beautiful place for you guys. So before we start, let's practice with the rule of life. And exhale all the toxicities and concerns, anything harassing your mind, anything bothering you, bring it to the feet of Jesus. And inhale the presence of the Lord. I'll be reading from Sarah Young's devotional. Taste and see that I am good. The more intimately you experience me, the more convinced you become of my goodness. I am the living one who sees you and longs to participate in your life. I am training you to find me in each moment and to be a channel of my loving presence. Sometimes my blessings come to you in, my, in mysterious ways, through pain and trouble. At such times, you can know my goodness only through your trust in me. Understanding will fail you, but trust will keep you close to me. Thank me for the gift of my peace a gift of such immense proportions that you cannot fathom its depth or breadth. When I appeared to my disciples after the resurrection, it was peace that I communicated first of all. I knew this was their deepest need, to calm their fears and clear their minds. I also speak peace to you, for I know your anxious thoughts. Listen to me, tune out other voices, so that you can hear me more clearly. I designed you to dwell in my peace all day, every day. Draw near to me. Receive my peace. Amen. Amen. Now we'll go to her as a, for a time of worship, and we'll see you back here. Bye, guys. Bye. Holy Spirit, guide my vision. Help me see the way. Jesus, ever Jesus Christ, in all is Christ in me. Holy Spirit, guide my speaking words of grace and truth abound. Let my lips be filled with stories of the mercy that I found. You're the light, you're my path, you're the shepherd of my soul, and all I am, and all I have, Holy Spirit, lead me on. Thank you.
I know there are times Where your dreams turn to dust You wonder as you cry Why it has to hurt so much So give me all your sadness Someday you will know the reason why Childlike heart mm -hmm. Simply keep your eyes on me Take my hand and walk Where I lead Keep your eyes on me Alone Don't you say why Were the old days better Just because you're scared of the unknown So take my hand and walk Don't live in the past Cause yesterday is gone Wishing memories would last you're afraid to carry on But you don't know what's coming But you know the one who holds tomorrow I will be your guide Take you through the night If you keep your eyes on me Take my hand and walk where I lead Keep your eyes on me alone Don't you say why were the old days better Just because you're scared of the unknown So take my hand and walk Where I lead You will never be alone is to be sure of what you hope for And the evidence of things unseen So take my hand and walk Yeah, 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 yeah Just like a child holding daddy's hand Don't let go of mine you know you can't stand on your own Take my hand and walk where I lead Keep your eyes on me alone Faith is to be sure of what you hope for And the evidence of things unseen Take my hand and walk Take my hand and walk Lord, we declare that you are the way, the truth, and the life. As Nathan sings this, let's declare this in our hearts and with our lips, together, with one another. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer for the world today. glory to the kingdom. 
So in the beginning of the year, we're going to kick off a conversation uh, with my mentor, Leighton Ford, Dr. Leighton Ford, with Dr. Francis Collins, the director of the NIH. Um, in this conversation, as we battle uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, Francis Collins uh, really expounds and explores the idea of faith um, and how we can get through the pandemic uh, the distribution of the vaccine, which he oversees, Dr. Francis Collins is Dr. Felch's boss in the NIH. Um, right here, Leighton uh, is close to Dr. Francis Collins for a long time, about 20 years now. Uh, this is a painting by Leighton uh, about his beloved dog, former dog Wrangler, about seeing heaven and in God's country, what he'll see as he enters there. And what a powerful reminder that there are far, far better things ahead than anything we leave behind and God is at work. So in this conversation, uh, we broke it up into two parts because it's about an hour long. Um, in the first part, uh, Francis Collins 
who I had the pleasure of meeting at Harvard when I did my fellowship and we kept in touch, um, talks about, as the national scientist of the United States, really, he's the Michael Jordan of science. I remember at the consortium, as he was delivering his speech, um, there were people fangirling and, and fans everywhere, groupies everywhere, in a sense, um, just getting in line to get a picture with this man. So uh, I think it's a good representation of, for many of us who are not in ministry, who are in the private sector, how you can become an influence in the world through your faith, be excellent in all that you do, but represent Jesus in the workplace. Faith and work at work. <laughs> Get it? That's a dad joke. But, um, it, it, you know, it, it's amazing that Francis Collins, as a Christian, is leading this chart, the scientific chart, globally in many ways. So the first conversation, we broke it down. He's, uh, Leighton's going to interview him about his conversion, his faith journey, um, and also the, the foundation he started about um, 15 years ago called Bio Lagos, Bio and Logos, together. And you can look at that the website, Bio Logos um, and Google. And it's about uh, faith and science coming together uh, as companions and not adversaries, how they can work together, how they complement one another. So check that out in your free time. Um, so in this segment, we're going to hear that his faith journey, Dr. Francis Collins' faith journey, and um, the foundation of Bias Lagos and what that is. And next week, uh, we're going to focus on the pandemic, the vaccine, climate change, um, and the miracle of the incarnation. And there are many interesting things and, and wisdom that's uh, really we can mine here in this conversation. So uh, we're very excited to show you. And so before we go, there'll be no scripture for the next two weeks, but a quote from Dr. F uh, Francis Collins' book, The Language of God. So let's go there right now for a quote, and we'll kick it off with Leighton and Francis right now. So see you in a bit. Bye. Hi, everyone. This week, we'll be reading an excerpt from The Language of God by Francis S. Collins, pages five through six. So here is the central question. In this modern era of cosmology, evolution, and the human genome, is there still the possibility of a richly satisfying harmony between the scientific and spiritual worldviews? I answer with a resounding yes. In my view, there is no conflict in being a rigorous scientist and a person who believes in a God who takes a personal interest in each one of us. Science's domain is to explore nature. God's domain is in the spiritual world, a realm not possible to explore with the tools and language of science. It must be examined with the heart, the mind, and the soul and the mind must find a way to embrace both realms. Happy New Year. Well, good morning. And good morning to Francis Collins. We do appreciate your being with us. And welcome to each one of you who's here for our uh, uh, hour or so this morning as we talk with our friend, Dr. Francis. We have the Leadership Breakfast Group here in Charlotte that uh, meets once a month. We read something from the Bible together. We uh, talk about uh, what's going on in our lives and our city and our world, and we pray together. And once a year, we've been having an annual Christmas Advent breakfast, which is, for many people, sort of the start of Advent. No breakfast this year, but I'm sure there's my, some of you have uh, coffee, and you may be munching away as we talk together. But I do want to, yeah, there we are. Francis, you got yours, and I have mine. Uh, I'm at home. I think Claude's at home. You're at home, I expect. I have I have a dog who may make an entrance uh, while we're here because he's always interested in science. So he may show up. We'll see. But thank you so much. And I want to thank the Y especially. Todd Tibbetts is a member of our leadership group and president of our Y. And uh, through their facility, <clears throat> we're able to <clears throat> have this and have a conversation with Dr. Collins this morning. So welcome to the leadership breakfast group and to especially your friends that you've asked to join us this morning. I hope it'll be an interesting, I'm sure it'll be an interesting time for us today. I also want to say uh, we're partnering with BioLogos, which is a very interesting institution that uh, Francis Collins helped to begin many years ago. And uh, this 
time this morning will be recorded and available on uh, their website, on the YMCA website, and our Light and Poor Ministries website. So, again, Claude Alexander, my friend, Bishop Claude Alexander, with a beautiful painting behind you and a big smile. And you know, Francis, I think you serve on the board of Lyle Logos. So, um, in any case, let me ask, first of all, Francis, we're sorry to get you up when you have a day of rest. I'm sure your days are all restful these days, but thank you for getting up early. And uh, uh, let me just ask this morning, and then I'm going over to Claude. Think back a year ago, December 2019. What were you looking for in the year 2020? Well, my goodness, that is going to be an interesting exercise. Good morning, everyone. Hello to Charlotte. Hello to all the people that are listening from all over the place. One of the bonuses, if there is one, of all of these virtual meetings is that we have a better outreach to people who don't happen to be geographically close together. So I appreciate all of those folks who are up on Saturday morning to have this conversation, to reflect a bit on where we are and where we're going. And Leighton, it's wonderful to be with you again. We've been friends for many years, uh, Leighton, and it's wonderful to be able to have this link up, even if it's virtually. And Bishop Claude, wonderful to see you this morning and appreciate all you've been doing for the kingdom and your role in helping with Biologos, which is this foundation that I had the chance to start about 12 years ago, which has become a really good meeting place for people who want to talk about science and Christian faith and how they actually are all harmonious together, if you think about it in a way that emphasizes harmony instead of conflict. So yeah, I'm glad to be with you. I'm, yeah, I've been up a while. Uh, I've been in this 24 seven mode pretty much uh, for a year now. And I'm talking to you from my home office, which is where I'm kind of serving as a hermit, <laughs> running the National Institutes of Health with its $42 billion a year operation <laughs> right here from these four walls. But it's, uh, it's what you need to do at, at a time of such unusual circumstance uh, with this uh, global pandemic all around us, and particularly right now at a very bad time in terms of the spread of the virus. Yeah, you ask a year ago, it's almost hard to imagine a year ago, time has changed its properties somehow in the last year. Things just seem to be going incredibly fast and also incredibly slow. And depending on the issue, I could argue either one. But yeah, December last year, I was getting ready for a wonderful Christmas with my family in North Carolina. I won't be doing that this year. And thinking about what are the things that we most wanted to try to accomplish in 2020 across the board in terms of new advances in cancer immunotherapy and gene therapy to cure sickle cell disease and new advances in diabetes and efforts in my own lab that were getting a new insight into aging and all of those things that the National Institutes of Health uh, can push forward in a dramatic way, being the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. And we didn't see this one coming. It was only in sort of late December, this suggestion, something was happening in Wuhan, China. And then by the second week of January, we knew we were in trouble and everything changed. And for the last 11 months, uh, this has been a singular focus of myself and almost everybody involved in medical research. How could we bring to bear on this challenge, all of the scientific resources that we might need uh, to figure out how to treat this disease, how to diagnose it quickly, and most importantly, how to prevent it with a vaccine. And it has been a breathtaking year. And there are things that have gotten done in these 11 months that I don't think anybody thought would be possible, but with the complete cooperation, collaboration between academia and government and industry, lots of international participation. We have done stuff. We have done stuff that I'm still rather astounded uh, got done in the timetable that we have now seen. And here we are on Saturday morning with just last night, the FDA approving yeah. distribution of a vaccine that is highly efficacious, 95%, and appears to be quite safe uh, for this terrible disease that we really only started to know about um, a little less than a year ago. That's about 10 times faster than it's ever happened. And I feel good about that. But of course, I also feel really worried and really troubled about the terrible, tragic course that this virus has played out over our country, including right now. Sort of the worst point we've been at in these 11 months is right now with the virus spreading rapidly across all parts of the country. 
and despite our efforts to try to contain it. And a lot of disagreement in the public about what we should be doing to try to stem the tide of this tragic disaster, including amongst Christians. So I'm glad we can talk about that part too. Anyway, glad to be with you all for a, a breakfast gathering and uh, many thanks uh, to the Y for hosting this. Let, let me ask you, what was it like for you when you saw that first vaccine shot given to the older lady in the UK? Uh, it was breathtaking. It was, I mean, it's a series of breathtaking moments. You know, the vaccine that's going to be debated this week by FDA, the one from Moderna, uh, is the one NIH had the even most close relationship with. And to have that one go into the first phase one trial, which meant volunteers being willing to be the first to receive it, that was 63 days after we knew about the virus. Usually that's like two years. So all the way along, these milestones have taken my breath away. And I guess for me, when I saw the first results of the large scale so-called phase three trial, and for both Pfizer and for Moderna, both of whom are using a rather similar but very novel approach called messenger RNA, to see 95% efficacy, I think most of us were hoping maybe it would be as good as 70% and it was 95%. Uh, that was a moment of thanks to God. I mean, really, we had no reason to expect it would be this good. I think we all, all raise a cup in thanks to the Lord and to you and all those who have been working on this. Praise the Lord for it. Praise the Lord Amen. indeed. Good news. Claude, what do you have to say in introducing our good, your good friend, our friend? Well, well again, uh, Francis, thank you. Um, thank you for how generous you are with your, with your, with your time, um, with your talent as well as with your treasure, you, you are a very generous individual. And I've, I've gotten a chance to see that really up close. M many people know Dr. Francis Collins as, as the director of the National Institutes of Health. Um, he's the 16th director. He, you, many know he's a physician geneticist, um, noted for the discovery of disease genes. And that this, this does play a role in, in how quickly we have come up with these, with these vaccines in terms of your work in cracking the human genome code. But, but, but a lot of people don't know as well uh, Francis Collins, the the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the one who journeyed from atheism to Christian belief and who's come to discover that science is not in conflict with the Bible. And, um, and, and out of whose personal journey, BioLogos came into being to, to provide a, a place and space to ask questions, discuss issues, learn from top Christian minds in the sciences and in and in theology, um, this this out of your personal journey, how BioLogos was was birthed to invite the church and the world to see the harmony between science and biblical faith. I I I had my first encounter in 2015, and of, of course, anyone who knows anything about the Human Genome Project is fascinated by Francis Collins the scientist, but then to, to hear you speak deeply and profoundly about your faith and then hear Deb Harsma uh, talk about the cosmos and, and unite them with the Psalms. And it gave me this appreciation that God is incredibly macroscopic and intensely microscopic. Mm -hmm. That's good. Francis, talk to us about that journey and and how for you, science informs faith and faith informs science. And then, then talk a little bit about BioLogos. Sure. Oh, Claude, thank you. That's a very generous introduction of some of the experiences that I've had over my 70 years on this planet. Yeah, I grew up in a family where faith was not considered very relevant. Um, it wasn't denigrated. It just wasn't considered something that you would want to spend time on. And so going through college and then off to graduate school studying physical chemistry, I had no real interest in faith and 
slipped into a mode of being initially an agnostic, although I'm not sure I even knew the word at that point. And, and then by the time I was a graduate student studying quantum mechanics, I was an atheist. Then I went to medical school, a rather sudden turn <laughs> in my professional hopes and dreams about how to apply science. And then those questions about life and death stopped being hypothetical because I was sitting at the bedside of good North Carolina people whose lives were probably not going to go on much longer. And I realized that I hadn't really thought through how I would deal with that. And in a very memorable moment, one of my patients, an elderly woman with really bad heart disease, after sharing her faith with me in a very open, personal, genuine way, uh, asked me what I believe. And I realized I had absolutely no answer. And that made me very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that began a bit of a journey on my part to try to understand why do these people believe this stuff anyway? <clears throat> I figured I needed to shore up my atheism by having a better understanding of the history of faith, which I assumed was mostly superstition. I thought Jesus was a myth. I didn't realize there was more evidence for his historical existence than for almost any other figure uh, in antiquity. And gradually over the time, uh, a couple of years it took, and a wonderful pastor down the street who exposed me to C.S. Lewis, <clears throat> I realized that atheism, atheism really was the least rational of all the choices for somebody trying to decide whether to believe in God. And especially for a scientist, we scientists were taught uh, not to assert universal negatives because something might change and you might discover that something you thought wasn't possible was possible. So universal negatives off the table. Well, that's what an atheist does is to say, I know there is no God. Not a good position to be in if you think you are somebody who's driven by evidence and an open mind. And I began to realize that there were pointers in science towards faith that I had neglected. The fact that the universe had a beginning, the Big Bang, calling out for some explanation of a creator that would have to be outside space and time. Oh my, that sounds like that might be Almighty God. And then the way the universe is put together with all of these mathematical, beautiful laws that explain the behavior of matter and energy, and yet they have constants in them that have just the value they have. And if they didn't, none of this would work. I mean, it wouldn't work at all. There'd be nothing interesting about the universe. If you change those constants, even a tiny, tiny fraction, wow, the heavens do declare the glory of God. This was an, a revelation. And of course, that was all fine. That got me to a deist position. But then there was this question about, does God care about me? And then I began to realize if God cares about me, God must be holy because he seems to have implanted this sense of right and wrong in me that I can't really understand in the other ways. And yet I know I'm often doing the wrong thing and I need a way to approach Almighty God who is ultimately holy with my very unholy self. And suddenly the need for Jesus became mm. so clear to me. And here we are at Advent <laughs> thinking about the need for Jesus. Well, there you go. Uh, were it not... Uh, for the way in which God came to this earth and took on the form of a human like me and made the ultimate sacrifice of giving his life and his blood, I wouldn't know how I could approach Almighty God without total fear and trembling. Instead, I'm given that gift uh, of Christ's life and death and resurrection, and I'm given the gift of grace. And that is gave me this great sense of understanding uh, and of peace. And as a 27-year-old um, first-year resident in internal medicine in Chapel Hill, uh, I accepted Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's been a while, uh, but it has been a wonderful synthesis for me, uh, an ability to be able to ask all of the questions you want to ask. Science can ask a lot of them. If it's about nature, if it's about the material world, well, science is the way to go. And believe me, this year of all years, we have used that in every possible way to understand this darn virus and how to go after it. But if you're interested in other questions, like why am I here? And uh, is there a God? And what happens after I die? What's the meaning of all this? Why is there something instead of nothing? Science doesn't help you with those. And it's a 
human being who wants to be fully holistically integrated into all the big questions, being a person of science and a person of faith seemed to make total sense. Now, I will tell you, when I first became a Christian, uh, people around me, uh, because I was quite happy to share this, I uh, thought it was lovely, but said, you know, this isn't going to last long because <laughs> your head's going to explode when you realize that what science is teaching you uh, about nature is totally incompatible uh, with what the Bible teaches you uh, about things that matter. I thought, well, okay, let's look at that. And here I am now, more than 40 years later, I have never encountered a conflict between what science teaches me and what the Bible teaches me. I've encountered plenty of situations where our interpretation of science is a little off and our interpretation of the Bible is a little off, but it's not that they are not fundamentally true. Mm -hmm. Science teaches you a certain number of things. I mean, it's convenient to say, and maybe it's sort of pretty close to true. Science teaches you how to answer the how questions and faith teaches you how to answer the why questions. And I love Francis Bacon's description of this, that God gave us not one book, but two. One book, which is the book of God's words, the Bible, which I read every day, and which gives me incredible insights and wisdom into who I am and who God is. But the other book, the book of God's works, which is nature. And I think we were supposed to read both of them and admire what we had been able to learn and to worship God through both of those. And I've said before, say again, I can worship God in the laboratory just like I can worship God in the cathedral. It's a different kind of worship, but it's all about the sense of awe at the creator. People concerned sometimes, oh, science is going to take all the awe out of creation. Oh, no, it just adds to it every time you uncover another layer of beauty and complexity and mathematical precision and meaning, uh, that awe factor just goes up and up and up. So you asked about biologos, let me quickly answer that part. So after living this life and finding that there was a fair amount of hunger out there, particularly on students about how science and faith might actually get along instead of being at war with each other, because most of the things being written were about the conflict, um, I decided maybe it would be good to write myself about this synthesis in a book called The Language of God, which I thought about 12 people would be interested in. And to my surprise, a lot of people suddenly were interested in reading it and sending me email and saying, OK, you kind of addressed my question on this page, but you didn't really get to the bottom of it. So what about this? And what about that? And in the first two weeks after the book came out, I had a thousand emails. And I couldn't possibly figure out how to manage this. And I felt like this is a conversation that needs to happen, but I'm not going to do this very well all by myself while I'm trying to run an institute at NIH. And so the notion of putting together a foundation and bringing alongside other wise people that had thought long and hard about this uh, seemed like, okay, this is a good moment uh, to do so. And so collecting around me uh, a few other deep thinkers, uh, scientists who were believers, BioLogos came into being, um, and that was actually uh, the official launch of that uh, happened in April of 2009, uh, 11 years ago. Uh, that same month, I was asked uh, to become the director of the National Institutes of Health, not just part of the NIH, but the director. And in one of those memorable moments in, in a uh, conference room in the White House surrounded by way too many lawyers, I was told that if you do this, you cannot have any official involvement with any other organization. And I said, oh, well, surely you don't mean that would apply to this foundation about science and faith that I've just helped get started. And they're like, no, it does apply to that. So what I had to do at that point was to step away from the foundation, put it in the hands of other incredibly dedicated folks. And it was uh, incredibly successful. Maybe it was better because I got out of the way and the foundation has now, over these 11 years, uh, become the place where millions of people go uh, to see what's happening. And they, come, they sponsor uh, really important gatherings to wrestle with some of these issues. Uh, they've started now a whole curriculum for homeschoolers and Christian high schoolers to try to put forward an alternative view to what sometimes is a bit hostile to science, or at least to some parts of science. And now with Deb Harzma, that Claude mentioned as the president, who's the former chair of astrophysics 
uh, at Calvin College. Uh, we have both the biological parts and the physical and astronomical parts all melded together. And what I think is a wonderful opportunity uh, to talk about how God is a God of reason, a God who's a creator who made science possible and gave us the gift through science to further appreciate the wonders of creation. And this is not something to be worried about or threatened about or fearful about, which I'm afraid still happens in a lot of churches, but something to celebrate. So that's the journey and still on the journey. And I guess we could talk a little bit this morning about where that journey takes us as Christians yeah. uh, at the time of COVID-19. That's, that's uh, thank you for that. It's very important.
Will you bow your heads for the benediction with me? What an amazing conversation. Let's pray for Dr. Francis Collins Layton in the body of Christ worldwide that's representing him. So much more than the little work, that little part of the work that we are doing here in New York City, that God is orchestrating a mosaic of people. So as you bow your head, remember that this gospel is global. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. All God's people say, amen. See you soon. Bye now. You know, the Bible says 365 times, do not fear. God knew that we would need his voice and presence every day throughout the year because we cannot control our psychosocial pressures or our exter external environment. And right now, with so much uncertainty surrounding us, many of us can't see beyond our fear, and that's why fear is paralyzing us. Well, yeah, the news now, Hong Kong's ongoing protest movement is showing no sign of slowing down in the new year. It tens of thousands of anti-government demonstrators taking to the streets on New Year's Day. President Trump has just been impeached on both Article 1, abuse of power. Retired Los Angeles Lakers basketball star Kobe Bryant has been killed in a helicopter crash. COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. 22 million Americans now say they've lost their jobs since this crisis began. Keep the curve down as low as you can. And now President Trump is considering a mandatory short-term quar quarantine. 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 For a period of 14 days. The confirmed global death toll from COVID just reached 1 million. We don't want to loot. That's not what we out here for. But we do want justice and we want equality. Nancy Pelosi tearing up. President Trump not guilty of abuse of power and the obstruction. It is a guilty verdict for the state's Hollywood film movie, Harvey Weinstein, on two counts after five days of deliberations after being held by officers. More than anything, right now, this world needs people that have an anchor. If we want to be ambassadors for Christ, we need this peace. And the, the Prince of Peace is Jesus. So in the storm, our advantage is that we have the Lord of the universe living among us and in us. And despite of our failings, despite of our fears, this moment, we're hearing good news that people who've never heard the gospel are hearing it remotely all over the world. It might be in your living room. This is an opportunity in our present moment to show people who the Lord is. I know there are times where your dreams turn to dust. <laughs> Thank you for all you do, man. Wonder you as you cry why it has to hurt so much. Give me all your sadness Someday you will know the reason why With a childlike heart mm -hmm. Simply keep your eyes on me Take my hand and walk where I I love how Koreans have translated Black Lives Matter. Hugin and Moksum, Sojungada. Hugin means black, Moksum means life. But this part, Sojungada, it's really touching. When you describe something as Sojungada, it means that it's worth protecting, it's precious. We are now leaving the wedding ceremony. <laughs> Terrifying parallel park. I don't ever want to park in New York City again. So good. Oh, 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 what's coming? But you know the one who holds tomorrow. I will be your guide. Take you through.
the night if you keep your eyes on me. Take my hand and walk where I lead. Keep your eyes on me alone. Hey guys, we just want to say hi. We missed you all. Josh, say something. Just because you're scared of the unknown. So take my hand and walk where I lead. You will never be alone. Faith is to be sure of what you hope for. And the evidence of things unseen. So take my hand. child holding daddy's hand don't let go of mine you know you can't stand on your own take my hand and walk where i lead keep your eyes on me alone faith is to be sure of what you hope for some things unseen So take my hand and walk Take my hand and walk home My name is Minyoung. I'm a member here at 1A Church, and we're so glad that you were able to attend today's service with us. Um, there are a few community news that I'd like to share with you all. The first announcement is about our tithes and offering. We want to remind all of our members here at 1A Church to keep God in the center of your life, which includes your finances. You guys can do so through the online payment method shown on the screen. You can give through Venmo at Church 180. Zelle and Chase QuickPay at offering at 180church.tv or if PayPal is your preferred method of giving, you can head over to our website at 180church.tv where there is a link to donate through PayPal. If you're a visitor joining us today, welcome. If you feel blessed by their service and you feel led to give, you can do so in the payment methods that I mentioned before. Our next announcement is about our prayer text hotline at 180 Church, which is available on text at 5397 Prayer and also via email at prayer at 180church.tv. This is a resource for everybody, and especially during this difficult time where we need some prayer and support, there is a prayer team that's ready to help you and to pray for all the requests that you may have. Um, if your prayers have been answered, you can also share them on the text hotline and we can celebrate the good news together. Next up is about small groups at 180 Church. These are smaller pockets of our community that meet on a weekly basis where we can dive a little bit deeper into the word and share how the message from that Sunday uh, spoke to us. We have a few different groups that are all meeting virtually now. And if you're not currently connected with the group, you can reach out to Pastor Billy at the email shown on the screen and he can get you plugged in into a group for you. On the topic of community, we also have a number of different social media handles and channels where you can follow us, like us, and love us during the week. We have a Tumblr page at 180BRG where we post a chapter of the Bible a day so you can read through the Bible with us. We also have a Facebook page at 180 Church. Dr. Sammy, our head pastor here at 180 Church, has a Twitter handle at Dr. Sammy Kim. We also have a YouTube channel at 180 Church NYC, where I'm sure most of you guys are watching us right now. And we also have two different Instagram pages at 180 Church and also at 180 BRG, where there are really encouraging posts and verses that get shared there. So I hope you guys will follow us there and be encouraged. We also have the 180 Church podcast with Dr. Sammy and friends, where you can tune in into a conversation and a dialogue that goes into goes into the word a little bit deeper with Pastor Lydia and Joe Wu, who is a member of our community here. It's always a great time just listening to them um, converse about how the message has spoke to them and has impacted them, and you can see how it can do the same for you. We also have a virtual 180 Cafe on the Discord app where you guys can come hang out at any time in different groups on different channels. And it's an easy way to stay connected with the community and also check in with one another. In addition to this, uh, we, have, we have a new addition, which is our SoundCloud. 
and it's a worship playlist of all the things that Pastor Lydia has played throughout this pandemic. So if you've been blessed by any song throughout this time, you'll see it there. Use it as a way to connect with God, to remember that God is with you, and to be blessed by Him and to bless others through this situation that's going on. And last but not least, if you'd like to learn more about our church and want to sign up for our weekly emails, you can come visit us at oneechurch.tv. That's it for all of our announcements. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Story of CF is history.